Welcome to NBF Presents Segregation to Suppression. I'm Natalie Green, Public Programs Manager at the National Book Foundation. Since 2018, we visited 40 states through our education and public programming. And we're so proud to bring NBF Presents to your homes tonight. And all season long, thanks to the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and to you all for joining us. Since 1950, the National Book Foundation has presented the National Book Awards to honor the best literature in America. We work year round to reach readers everywhere. We've donated nearly 1.5 million books to public housing authorities. And this fall, we granted over 3.5 million to nonprofit literary arts organizations and publishers alongside our friends at the Academy of American Poets and Community of Literary Magazines and Presses. We're thrilled to join you virtually this fall through a full slate of events that culminate in our digital 71st National Book Awards ceremony on November 18th. Everyone is invited. You can save your spot at nationalbook.org slash awards 2020. On our website, you can also help support this work by donating. In a year without our in-person award ceremony and benefit dinner, these contributions are more vital than ever before. For those that are able to make a suggested donation of $25 or more for this evening's event, we'll send a direct link where you can do so in the chat. Thank you so much for making our year-round programming possible. And for tonight's event, which will feature National Book Award honored authors Carol Anderson and Richard Rothstein in conversation, moderated by Brookings Fellow Andre M. Perry. We'll talk about how American policies inform segregation and ultimately suppression. Even being behind the scenes for a few moments with these brilliant folks makes me so excited for the conversation you're about to witness. Real-time live captioning is available and linked to in the chat. And we'll also share the link to buy these authors outstanding books with gratitude to our season's bookseller partner, Loyalty Bookstores. For tonight's program, Andre will chat with the authors before opening up to a few questions from the audience. Feel free to pop those into the live chat throughout the conversation. And without further ado, Carol Anderson is the Charles Howard Candler Professor and Chair of African American Studies at Emory University. She's the author of Eyes Off the Prize, The United Nations and the African-American Struggle for Human Rights, 1944 to 1955, Bourgeois Radicals, The NAACP and the Struggle for Colonial Liberation, 1941 to 1960, The New York Times bestseller, White Rage, The Unspoken Truth of Our Racial Divide, and One Person, No Vote, How Voter Suppression is Destroying Our Democracy, which was long listed for the National Book Award for Nonfiction. Her young adult adaptation of White Rage, We Are Not Yet Equal, was nominated for an NAACP Image Award. Richard Rothstein is the author of many, many books and articles about race and education, among which is The Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America, which was long listed for the National Book Award for Nonfiction. And our moderator for the evening, Andre M. Perry, is a fellow in the Metropolitan Policy Program at Brookings a scholar in residence at American University, and a columnist for the Heckinger Report. He is the author of the new book, Know Your Price, Valuing Black Lives and Property in America's Black Cities. And now I'll let them take it away. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Natalie. It's a pleasure to be here and actually interview two of my, some of my favorite authors. Carol and Richard, I wanted to say that in writing of my book and my research, I've drawn your books and 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 uh, a rabbit ear many pages time and time again. So I want I'm I'm honored to present to you today. Um, but I just want to start off. We're five days out from an election, a contentious, controversial election. I want to know how you're feeling. So I'm going to start with you, Richard. How are you feeling right now? Scared. Scared. Tell me, tell say more. Well, this could be, um, you know, this is a turning point in American history. Either we're going to go back to a period of normalcy and uh, a democratic society with all its flaws, or we're going to continue on a path towards authoritarianism and uh, contempt for constitutional norms. And it's so close. And of course, all of us have a memory of 2016 when the polls were great and the results were not. And um, 
you know, it's it the the you know the experts all say that they fixed those mistakes, but I don't think any of us really believes that. And so um, I'm scared. I think we're all scared, and we're all trying to work as hard as we can to make sure that we take the first path of a a return to a um, a society with with norms as well as rules that uh, people honor in public life. Carol, how are you feeling? Somewhere between hopeful and determined and wary. Mm. The hopeful is seeing this massive voter turnout, over 70 million votes cast already, which was more than um, either candidate in 2016 received. And so seeing that kind of voter turnout in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of massive voter suppression, that's where the hope is. Determined is to continue to spread the word not to expect um, results on election day and don't fall for that mess um, because this is somebody trying to preempt um, democracy. And wary, because, and I I know you've heard me say this before, where we are right now is is in, as Richard laid out, this really key moment in American history. And you have one group that is following the Marquis de Queensberry rules, you know, that you make sure that you've got your boxing trunks. You make sure that, you know, you've got enough padding in your gloves. You don't do rabbit punches. You don't do kidney punches. You don't hit folks when they're down. And then you've got the Wide World Wrestling Federation, where there are no rules. And so you will, you will do a fly, flying suplex, then pull the can opener out of your boot, distract the ref, gouge out, you know, have blood streaming down your opponent's eyes. The ref turns back and looking, you're like, what? And you play the victim. <laughs> so, I mean, so you've got one set of folks who don't have any rules. And you have another set of folks who are playing by the rules. And so part of what we're really wrestling with here are, are we going to live in a nation with rules? Are we going to live in a nation with norms? Are we going to abide by the rule of law? Are we going to have a real vibrant democracy? And that's what's on the line. Um, Oh, so much at stake and um the reason one of the reasons why i appreciate both of you because your work really shows your gift for showing how past policy impacts the present sometimes we forget how that past policy is still with us but it is but i'm going to ask you to project into the future from using your lens of the past um how do we emerge from this period of unrest and uncertainty? How do you predict um, we come out of this and and, and provide some historical precedent um, for your response? And we'll start with Carol this time. I think think one of the things that has happened in the midst of this pandemic is that more people are really feeling their vulnerabilities um, in a way that, that say residential segregation And an occupational uh, segregation has allowed a kind of invulnerability. So that stuff is happening out there. What the pandemic did was it showed the vulnerabilities of everybody. And then seeing the massive police violence that has rained down on African-Americans and seeing how that hasn't been contained within the black community so that you see an elderly white man being pushed down in Buffalo and his head cracking the ground and blood coming out of his ear and the police just walking by. Um, You see a a white woman who who ended up with a, a rubber bullet in her head in Portland. And so it begins to say that the things, these ills that that there's something really gone awry and off the rails in American democracy. And so we're having conversations like we haven't had in a long time about this democracy. 
I think one of the reasons why we're seeing the massive voter turnout is because people are willing to fight, as John Lewis says, with the most powerful nonviolent weapon we have, the vote for this democracy. What I see emerging out of this is an ongoing conversation about the kinds of policies and values we must implement in order to have the kind of democracy that we deserve, the kind of a democracy that leads and that, that aligns with America's aspirations as a nation that says, we the people. And so that's what this battle is, is about. But seeing this massive outpouring, I mean, in the summer, we had a 50 state protest movement, mm. 50 states. Americans are hungry for democracy. There are forces, as we know, that are trying to stamp that down. I think we're going to come out of this stronger and better. Well, Richard, um, how do we come out of this? Well, I hope Carol is right. It's certainly the case that we are now having in this country a more accurate and passionate discussion about the legacy of slavery and of Jim Crow than we ever have had before in American history. It's really unprecedented. We had 25 million people uh, participate in Black Lives Matter demonstrations uh, during the summer and spring, and a majority of those were whites, which is unprecedented, absolutely unprecedented. We have um, white elected Southern politicians running around the South, removing statues that commemorate the defenders of slavery. Inconceivable, just six years ago, five or six years ago. Mm. We have, um, as you all know, at the National Book Foundation, uh, you know, all of the best, -selling, not all, a majority of the best selling nonfiction books in this country for quite a while now are about race. Mm. Who could have dreamed that that would happen? Uh, you know, I, um, uh, the Color of Law, this, this book that I wrote, I had trouble getting it published because I was told by agents and publishers that um, we're in a post-racial society. Nobody's interested in this stuff anymore. Wow. And um, obviously uh, that uh, was not an accurate assessment. <laughs> so, um, you know, so we are having, I say, a more accurate and passionate discussion about race. The real question in my mind is whether out of that accurate and passionate discussion, a new civil rights movement emerges that will, as John Lewis said, make good trouble around the issue of residential segregation, which underlies all of the other forms of uh, inequality that we have in this country, predominantly racial inequality. Um, marches are important, demands are important, but uh, as in the 1960s, we need an organized civil rights movement, people who are disciplined, focused, and that hasn't yet emerged. That hasn't yet emerged. And um, so I'm hopeful that it can emerge because certainly the, um, the underlying growing understanding about uh, what we face is there, and that's essential precondition of such a civil rights movement. But uh, it needs to go beyond understanding. Would you, would you say the Black Lives Matter movement is a civil rights movement? No, I, I not not. It's not an organized force. Uh, it doesn't have local chapters that are taking action around uh, segregation. Its focus has been primarily. I'm not criticizing. It's wonderful what they've done. Its focus, as it should have been, is on uh, police um, abuse of African Americans, about reform of police with some vague calls for reparations, but uh, we need much more disciplined and focused uh, groups that are going to, in their local communities, make it uncomfortable to maintain not just police abuse, but the whole range of policies of segregation and patterns of segregation that, as I write in my book, were created unconstitutionally and that we have an obligation as American citizens to remedy. Now, I want to get into the content of both your work and, and, and find some intersections. Um, one person, no vote, color of law. Um, incredible in terms of talking about housing discrimination and voter suppression, res respectively. But can you make the connections for me? Um, what is the connection between voter suppression and housing discrimination? And then we'll go to Richard first. Well, 
I, I think it's more general than that. The underlying cause of much of the inequality that we have in this country that's racial is housing segregation, which was unconstitutionally created. You know, Carol referred earlier to somebody who wrote to her uh, saying that um, uh, African Americans just like to live with each other. Well, that's a common um, misconception in this country. It's something that people um, believe uh, sincerely. We have this myth, uh, we call it de facto segregation, that the, the reason we're so segregated is that it just happened naturally because people like to live with each other of the same race and maybe throw in some private discrimination as well on the part of banks and real estate agencies. Mm -hmm. People don't understand, and uh, but they're learning that uh, the racial segregation that we have, which is so powerful in every metropolitan area of this country, underlies most of the serious social problems that we face. And um, when you concentrate um, the most disadvantaged uh, people in this country in single neighborhoods and reinforce and create their disadvantage, it makes them uh, prey to um, uh, abuse of all kinds. And voter suppression is one of them, in addition to um, uh, police violence. Uh, we would not have um, the kind of possible voter suppression uh, that we have now if we weren't so rigidly segregated as a country. And um, let me say this, uh, I don't know how, relating to the previous uh, uh, question that you ask, I don't know how we ever um, develop the common national identity that we need to preserve this democracy. If so many African Americans and whites live so far from each other, that they have no ability to understand each other, no ability to empathize with each other, uh, no ability to, um, as I say, develop a common national identity. So um, I think that um, we need to address it. I'm hopeful that we will. Uh, voter suppression could not exist if it weren't for this concentration of um, African Americans, particularly most disadvantaged African Americans in low-income neighborhoods, which is a, a creature of policy. And if policy created it, policy can uncreate it. And I think that's the lesson that we need to take away. Carol, make this connection between housing discrimination and voter suppression. And so you'll see it in the kind of multiple forms of voter suppression. For instance, after the U.S. Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act in the Shelby County v. Holder decision in 2013, um, the states that had been under what they called the pre-clearance provision, and those were states that had a history of discriminating against their American citizens' right to vote, that they had to have any of their laws or policies like okayed first by the US Department of Justice before implementing them. After the US Supreme Court gutted that uh, provision, we saw things like massive poll closures in the um, pre-clearance states. So out of almost 1,700 polls that were closed from 2014, to, to uh, about 2018, of those polls, about 1,200 of them came out of the pre-clearance states alone. Mm. So in Georgia, for instance, Georgia closed over 200 polling places. 75% of those were in minority and poor communities. What we know from the data are that for every 10th of a mile, that you move a polling place from the black community, black voter turnout goes down by 0.5%, up to four miles. So if you can create up to a 20% drop in black voter turnout simply by moving the polling place because it deals with the lack of transportation, which is, which is part of the public policy, which is mm -hmm. also part of the, the the economic inequality that is pouring down on that neighborhood. So you move the polling place and boom, you can bring about lower black voter turnout. We see it in terms of what happened in, for instance, Alabama, where Alabama um, required uh, government issued photo ID to vote, but then said that public housing ID did not count. 71% of those in public housing in Alabama are African-American. Mm -hmm. And so, and for many, as the NAACP Legal Defense Fund noted, for many of them, it was the only government issued photo ID they had. 
So you can see how housing begins to tie into, or then we can look at gerrymandering. Um, extreme partisan gerrymandering. And what that does is, is it allows politicians to choose their electorate instead of allowing the electorate to choose who their representatives will be. By drawing the districts in such a way that minimize and dilute the power, the electoral voice and power coming out of particularly large urban areas like Milwaukee mm -hmm. and amplifying the, the electoral voice and power of those who are living in predominantly white suburbs and in predominantly white rural areas. And so this is how housing and the policies that have created segregated housing, the policies that have created economic inequality tied to race in so many ways are then linked and then provides a gateway for those who are voter suppressors to figure out how do we craft the policies to target that group. It's how the Fourth Circuit in um, North Carolina said, you have targeted African Americans with almost surgical precision. Wow, you know, um, I'm gonna, you're in Georgia right now. Woo! You live in Georgia. Now, um, Richard's absolutely right. We still continue to live separately. Um, however, the number of black uh, majority cities has increased over the last 20 years. Um, there's been a, an additional 100 more black majority cities added to um, the United States since 2000. And a lot of them are in the suburbs. I want to talk about how the sh how shifting housing patterns has changed this electoral race. Can you, and I'll stay with you, Carol, and you can speak to, to uh, the, the very diverse state of Georgia and how is it impacting that Georgia race? Yeah, so one of the things, um, and we saw this earlier, we saw this in 2016, we saw it in 2018, the growing diversity of, of Georgia is making it um, harder harder because it, 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 for, for all of these various methods of voter suppression to keep out everybody. Um, and so we had a, 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 in the 2016 race, there was a congressional race. And in Cobb County, which had been like overwhelmingly white, the a section of it, there had been a, 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 a Republican who was, you know, in a safe district. Well, black folks were moving into Cobb County, which is a suburb of, 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 of Atlanta, and barely won. <laughs> he bar so the state legislature, the Republican legislature, decided to redraw the district maps right there in the middle of the decade to, to move all of the black folks out of his district and put in more whites from Cobb County in another area of Cobb County in his district to try to create a safe district for him. I mean, so this is the ways that residential, the, 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 the growing diversity in these suburbs no longer makes them all nice and safe. And so you see this mid-decade scramble to try to figure out how do we create these kind of racially homogenous districts that 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 can keep us in power. Um, we're seeing that again with with the election that's happening right now. So even as you hear these calls about I'm going to keep your suburbs safe, which is just I mean, let's just face it, boy isn't even dog whistling anymore, <laughs> right? He's just straight up in the bull the bullhorn. Right, the bullhorn um, is is that that isn't working as well because these suburbs, uh, particularly in a space like let's take Atlanta, where you have a sizable black middle class, and so you get movement in these spaces as Atlanta grows. It's getting harder and harder. And, and this is, I, I'll just throw this, this is why I think we're seeing the push for flooding the judiciary because at a certain point, what's happening in our electoral politics can, can, can't be stopped solely by these voter suppression policies.
Um, and so Richard, now they're hoping that the courts can stop it. Richard, how is housing uh, pattern changes impacting um, elections? Well, we're in a very fluid demographic situation now. Uh, it began with the, uh, and it's particularly intense in Atlanta, with the uh, growth of a black middle class that uh, was able to depart from the lowest income neighborhoods <clears throat> and left those neighborhoods in much more distressed condition than they were uh, previously. It's a, it, this is not something to criticize, but um, it's a problem that we've never addressed. But many of these suburbs that are now more diverse are not permanently more diverse. They're in transition. Mm. And uh, if we want to maintain diverse suburbs, we need explicit policies to do that because many of the, you know, what, what's happened historically for the last 50 years is as African Americans have moved uh, out towards suburbs, those suburbs gradually turn from all white to all black. And we have many cities in this country now, which are where the suburbs <clears throat> are as segregated uh, for African Americans as the urban areas were. Ferguson, and, uh, for instance. Ferguson. Ferguson. Uh, yeah, yeah, right, right, yeah. And um, uh, unless we we uh, enact policies to stabilize the desegregation of those suburbs so that they remain diverse, we're seeing it. We'll, all we'll see is a temporary phenomenon of diversity. And that's one of the chief um, concerns that I think uh, we need to address. And that can only be addressed, I'm repeating myself, with civil rights groups in those communities that uh, demand the enactment of those policies. We cannot rely on politicians. Politicians at this point don't have the kind of pressure upon them to enact the policies that are necessary. And uh, to use the same analogy, just as the politicians of the 1960s only responded to uh, the pressure of an organized movement in order to enact the Voting Rights Act. I mean, we just spent a, a good bit of time uh, celebrating the life of John Lewis. And we know that the Voting Rights Act didn't come about because politicians thought it was a good idea. And the same thing is true of the policies that we, we need enact, to enact today. So I'm gonna ask you this, because it sounds like you're not necessarily that optimistic that a change in administration will bring about the kind of policy change that you want? No, I'm not optimistic that a change in administration alone okay. uh, will do so. <clears throat> uh, you know, the Obama administration was a civilized administration. Uh, it's, <laughs> it had the characteristics that we need to um, retain. But when it comes to enacting policies, to redress the segregation that causes the problems that we're facing today, it didn't do much. <clears throat> it couldn't do much because there was no popular demand to do so. And uh, simply sitting around, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not minimizing the importance of voting for candidates who are um, more oriented towards uh, racial justice, but waiting for them to do it uh, is not going to make it happen. And we need a... Uh, an organized uh, popular movement that's going to create the conditions, the environment in which better political leaders can do what they may wish they could do, but cannot do now. Um, I'm gonna stick with you, Richard, on this and, and gonna go back to a, a point that Carol made around the rhetoric of the Trump administration around protecting the suburbs. And, I, and in both of your work, you show how this rhetoric is almost used as policy um, that, or to, to um, forecast policy moving forward. Um, how is rhetoric used as a tool, a policy tool, um, particularly for discrimination? Well, let's talk about the particular example you're referring to, uh, uh, Trump's um, uh, claim that the suburbs were under threat. And the context of that was the Trump administration's repeal of a rule that the Obama administration had enacted uh, called the Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing Rule, which required suburbs to analyze the extent to which they were segregated, uh, come up with uh, plans to desegregate, with the um, prospect uh, 
that if they didn't implement those plans sometime in the distant future, long after the Obama administration would be out of office, the federal government might withhold funds from those suburbs. The fact is that not a single dollar was withheld uh, under the Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing Act. And I might be a little bit cynical to say that you didn't need a rule for suburbs to figure out that they were segregated. <laughs> uh, in 1970, uh, we had a uh, Secretary of Housing and Urban Development in the Nixon administration. Uh, his name was George Romney. You may have heard the last name. Uh, he's the father, was the father of um, the um, uh, present uh, senator from Utah. Romney would, um, had a much, much more aggressive program than the Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing program. Uh, this came in the wake of uh, the Civil Rights Movement it, uh, in its waning days. Um, Romney not only threatened sometime in the distant future to withhold funds from suburbs that refused to take steps to desegregate, he actually did withhold funds from those suburbs. And uh, Nixon, who was then developing the uh, racial polarization that the, the Republican Party has exploited ever since, forced Romney out of office because of it and canceled the Romney program. Uh, but that, that happened, that came much closer to making the kind of progress that we need than anything that was done in the Obama administration. And it only happened because we had a lot of turmoil in the streets about civil rights, uh, and I might say in the streets and the bridges about civil rights uh, than we have today. Carol, how is, re how is rhetoric used in policy? Um, I think one of the ways that, to me, a key element in the way that rhetoric is used is the rhetoric of fear. Mm. That um, your, your homes are being invaded, your neighborhood is being invaded. Um, you are under siege. Um, I, I saw this, the language back in the 1920s when a doctor up in Detroit, Ossian Sweet, had um, moved out of Black Bottom, which was the, the segre racially segregated Black area of Detroit. He moved out. 25% um, of the homes in Black Bottom did not have indoor plumbing in the 1920s. I mean, this is, and so he moved out, his house was surrounded and the, a neighborhood association came up talking about let's stop the invasion. So Trump's language is not new. It is playing on the politics of fear, the politics of what I call the zero sum game, that the only way that African-Americans can get will be at white's expense. Um, and so that politics of fear then allows for these policies that are racially motivated, but have a kind of race neutral now, race neutral cover in them. So when we talk about zoning laws, for instance, that say, okay, if you're gonna build here, your home has to be a minimum of say 3000 square feet, and that it has to have a minimum of like 200, dollars per square foot. So what that does with those kinds of rules is it begins to economically remove folks. And what we know about uh, systemic racial inequality and the wealth difference, the wealth gap in America is to create this way to say, see how we're keeping you safe with these zoning laws. And so that's how the policy works. It works on the policy, the language of fear. Fear is instrumental in driving these policies. It's instrumental in driving voter suppression. We're here to, to keep your ballots for your, your, the elections democracy from being stolen. Um, it's, it's fear. We're, the police are here to keep you safe. It's fear. We're keeping all of those people out from your neighborhoods. If we understand how fear works, then we're able to really begin to get at, at, at what's going on. And so as Richard talked about, we see this, this massive movement of African-Americans to the suburbs. What we also see then is, I, I remember years ago, Andrew Hacker had this, this study in uh, Two Nations where he talked about that once a neighborhood became like 7% black, 7%, that 
whites were like, oh my God, the neighborhood is like black. It's like overwhelmingly black. And oh my God, it's like black. Um, and, and from that, that fear, that helped in the, in the movement of whites out of that neighborhood because now it was too black the fear that their property values were going to go down, the fear that crime was going to come in. And so fear and the racism that drives fear is instrumental in the policies that then get developed. And to be clear, racism, I mean, uh, uh, black people don't bring property values down, racism does. Um, but I wanna get into a few solu solutions here. Richard, um, you um, have chronicled housing policy and the um, uh, erosion of policies that encourage integration. Moving forward, what kind of policies do you want to see that encourages integration? Well, I'll answer your question because you've asked it. <laughs> but my view is that we know plenty about policies. I'm repeating myself. Okay. Uh, we know what all the policies are. What we don't have is an organized civil rights movement mm -hmm. that's going to demand the implementation of those policies. Okay. So I, let me give you, I'll answer your question now, having said that at first, <laughs> because, but policy ideas is not our problem. Uh, for example, uh, the white suburbs were initially created, as I said, in an unconstitutional fashion by the Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration that embarked on a, uh, an explicit program, racially explicit program to move white families who at that point were working class, uh, lower middle class, uh, out of urban areas where they were living uh, into single family homes in all white suburbs. Uh, this was an explicit racial policy, was written out in the federal policy manual. It wasn't the action of rogue bureaucrats. And that's how the white suburbs, uh, except for the very affluent who were there before, that's how they were created. Well, those suburbs at the time that the Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration was creating them sold for about uh, eight, nine thousand dollars a piece. Those homes, they were modest homes. In today's money, that's about one hundred thousand dollars. But those homes no longer sell for one hundred thousand dollars. They sell for three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars. So, um, I, you know, I'm sure there are some lawyers uh, watching this program uh, now. What would be a narrowly targeted remedy for that constitutional violation? Mm. Well, the federal government should be buying up houses it, at current market rates in these uh, exclusive white suburbs, and there are many that are still exclusively white, and reselling them to African Americans at deeply discounted prices that uh, are affordable to them that mm. uh, they their families could have moved into had they been permitted to at the um, uh, in the mid 20th century. So that's a policy, a, a narrowly targeted remedy for a very specific constitutional violation. Uh, we also have, um, well, we've already talked about the zoning rules. Those zoning rules, I, uh, I think, uh, were adopted to perpetuate an unconstitutionally created segregation and so themselves are subject to challenge. And if we understood this history, we would challenge those zoning rules. Uh, I'm not suggesting we shouldn't have residential zoning. We should. We shouldn't be placing industry and polluting industries and large commercial projects in um, residential neighborhoods. But there's no reason why any community should uh, exclude townhouses and garden apartments and uh, low-level apartment buildings um, that uh, can be accessible to a more diverse population. Uh, but the zoning rules are a block to that. They should be repealed. We have programs at the low income uh, scale uh, that are disproportionately African American and uh, Hispanic in many places now. <clears throat> Those programs reinforce segregation. Uh, uh, the biggest one is, uh, and I don't want to get too much into the weeds now, but the biggest program we have at the federal level is the low income housing tax credit, mm -hmm. which is a subsidy to uh, uh, developers to build low income units. Uh, for uh, families who otherwise couldn't afford to rent apartments at market rates. And um, the Federal Treasury Department has a priority for placing low-income units in already low-income neighborhoods to reinforce their segregation. That policy needs to be changed. It's not that we don't know it needs to be changed. Uh, it's that we don't have the political power to change them. And so that's our, our focus and where our focus should be. Uh, I'll mention just one other, that another program that 
um, everyone is familiar with, and that's uh, the Section 8 voucher program, which is a subsidy to families who, who make a little bit more than uh, in income than the low-income housing tax credit families are eligible for. Um, that program also reinforces segregation today. Uh, landlords in most of the country uh, are permitted to refuse to rent to somebody simply because they have a Section 8 voucher that's helping them pay the rent. That kind of uh, discrimination, which is permitted by law, should be prohibited by law. There are a few jurisdictions that prohibit it. That should be done everywhere. The vouchers are calculated uh, in a way that um, it's based on average rents throughout a large area. It doesn't take a genius to realize that those average rents are too low to use them in um, high opportunity communities and too high to use them in existing low income segregated communities. So landlords in those communities exploit the program by charging more in rent than the market requires. Well, those uh, voucher amounts should be redistributed to create the possibility of families who want to do so to move to neighborhoods that have better jobs and better transportation to jobs and cleaner air and um, uh, schools with higher performing students. So again, uh, these policies are well known. Uh, we need a, um, a mobilized civil rights movement that's going to do more than just shout slogans, but is going to actually uh, take direct action and build political power in local communities with these policies in mind. Carol, the Voting Rights Act has been gutted um, in so many ways. What does a new Voting Rights Act look like or an updated one? It looks like the one that's sitting on Mitch McConnell's desk right now. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the first things that the Congress, the House of Representatives did after uh, the election in 2018 was to pass two major bills that deal with strengthening voting rights. One was HR1 that provides for things like election day being a federal holiday, so people don't have to choose between the right to vote and having to get to work and make a living. Um, and it provided for automatic voter registration um, so that you're automatically registered to vote. So there aren't these hurdles that you have to jump through and jump over and around. Um, and we know that automatic voter registration works in the states where it is um, law, it is functioning fine. There's also what was the Voting Rights Act. After I, you know, I noted how the US Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act, um, saying that you know, racism really isn't a force in American society anymore. It's kind of like the post-racial mess you dealt with when you're trying to get your book done, right? <laughs> Out there, right. Oh, we don't do race anymore. Uh, yeah, we do. And, 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 and said that it picked on the South and the standards were old. And so this new Voting Rights Act, which is now called the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, has things like a new standard for how states come under preclearance. And it has a 25 year window in there saying, if you have discriminated against your folk in the past 25 years, the DOJ has a right to look at all of your laws, must look at all of your voting laws before they are implemented. So we're not in this phase where we are right now, where we are adjudicating, 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 litigating, litigating, litigating um, laws that are clearly racist. So that's what it looks like. And so that's why this election is so important because it's not just about the presidency. It is also about down ballot, all the way down ballot, and what that down ballot can mean for the way that we live our lives. Now, I want to um, ask a question around Stacey Abrams. She may have lost the, her um, bid for the governor's office, but she has started or, relit or revived the movement around voter rights. Certainly the Democrats every year, every cycle, they'll, they'll put something on the table. But um, after Stacey Abrams, it's really taken off. Um, um, can you talk a little bit about the importance of Stacey Abrams and what she represents? Stacey Abrams, one, she started off, you know, she was a state legislature, state legislator here. And she, before that, she had an organization called the New Georgia Project, which was about registering folks to vote, going into these communities where most folks weren't going and, and getting them registered to vote. 
Ryan Kemp, who was the Secretary of State, came after the New Georgia Project hollering voter fraud. Basically, it was a lie, as the language of voter fraud is. But again, it is to stoke fear. She ran against him, and, and he pulled every stunt in the book. Remember, WWE wrestling. <laughs> there are no rules. So you can be the ref in the match that you're fighting. I'm just saying. So afterwards, her concession speech was not a concession speech. That was a beautiful, powerful speech. And from that, she built an organization called Fair Fight. And that Fair Fight is, is about making this democracy work through massive voter registration, but also challenging in the courts these voter suppression laws and taking this beyond Georgia to these other states that are also wrestling with the same issues that Georgia has. That is powerful. And Fair Fight is also working with these other organizations that have been there in the trenches, like the LDF, like the League of Women Voters, like the NAACP, like the ACLU, litigating the crap out of these folks while also having grassroots organizations who are doing the heavy lifting of democracy. And so I think that's one of the things that I'd, I'd like to, to say as well, is that we may not see movement, but there is movement. These grassroots organizations are doing that massive groundwork that must happen. It was the groundwork that also happened in the civil rights movement before the civil rights movement became the civil rights movement. Now I'm going to ask a few questions from the audience, um, and one of, one of which you already answered uh, Carol, around the, the Voting Rights Act. So I'm going to turn to um, another one for Richard. How how would you respond, Richard, to city council members who assume that apartments bring crime? Are there studies I can write, I can cite when discussing these stereotypes with the council? Well, I'm not aware of any studies <clears throat> that demonstrate that apartments bring crime. But uh, I will say that... Um, Poverty does breed, breed crime. Disadvantage breeds crime. Uh, the best anti-crime um, program that we can enact is one that offers good jobs to people who are living in communities where they're not available. And uh, that's uh, the most important uh, anti-crime program that we can uh, follow. Uh, yeah, the, the notion that uh, the single-family suburbs are uh, islands of uh, purity uh, as, as you well know, drug use is higher in, the, in many of them. Uh, the high schools in some of these single family uh, uh, exclusive suburbs are um, infested with uh, uh, drug abuse. Uh, this is not a, um, uh, a teenagers um, uh, engaging in um, behavior that uh, would not be tolerated in a um, low income neighborhood, but that is tolerated uh, in um, middle class white neighborhoods. Uh, is uh, prevalent. So I don't think that there's a, um, uh, uh, a correlation between apartments and crime, but there is a correlation between concentrating people in areas of disadvantage and crime. And we know that crime rates, uh, violent crime rates are higher in um, communities where people have no hope and have no opportunities uh, to um, uh, have uh, better lives. But you bring up a good point is that we need to look at criminalization of people, not necessarily crime, because obviously what you mentioned, there's there's quote unquote behaviors that are similar in the suburbs and white areas. It's just not pursued. Um, I'm going, I have a question for Natalie. I mean, I'm from Natalie to Carol. As a professor at Emory, can you speak a bit about um, what teaching and engaging with your students on the current election looks like? Oh, yeah. I'm actually, I'm teaching a class this semester called Voting Rights and Voter Suppression. OK, so did you just like put that one up there for me to spike the ball or something? <laughs> so uh, we start off at the particularly we start off at the beginning about the ways that voting rights have unfolded, the kinds of barriers and, and laws that have been in place. And my students are so engaged. It is a research writing course. 
and the topics that they're working on. So some are working on grassroots organizing. Some are working on the politics of voter suppression. Some are, are, are working on the economics of voter suppression. Some are looking at the ways that demographics play into how voter suppression works and doesn't work in there. Some are looking at felon disfranchisement um, and the criminalization of blackness that in fact pours people into these, 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 these areas. Students are on fire. My students are on fire. But I think this, 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 this flame that we're seeing is part of a larger movement across this nation as we're seeing massive, massive, almost record-breaking turnout from those who are from 18 to 29 years old. Um, Richard, how... How can architects and the construction industry work towards better integrated cities? What role do these architects and contractors play? I'm sorry to be repeating myself, Andre, <laughs> but you know, architects- They need to get in the streets? <laughs> architects, and, architects and contractors are citizens. And that's the most important place that they have a role to play. Because the things we need to do that architects and developers should do are not now possible politically. For example, we have this absurd, um, in my view, housing policy that uh, sets aside a share of units in market rate developments for low income families, for the lowest income families. There is no share set aside for moderate income families. There's a missing middle. Uh, architects should be designing that, but of course there are no subsidies for them because uh, uh, we don't believe in that. We're only providing housing for a few poor people in the midst of the very rich. And um, that's not a formula for social harmony. What we need to do is be uh, creating communities that are mixed income in a truly sense, not just mixing the very rich and the very poor, but including also um, moderate families, moderate income families, working class families. You know, when public housing began in this country in the 1930s, it wasn't for poor people. It was for working class families who paid the full cost of the public housing and their rent. It was the most desirable housing available. We should be building public housing that is desirable housing where some units in the public housing will be sold at market rates, where others will be moderately subsidized so that working and middle-class families can afford them, and some that will be deeply subsidized as a few units are now. Well, architects have a big role to play in designing those, but there are no uh, clients for those today. Uh, localities as well as the federal government. The federal government's not gonna do it. Localities should be creating those subsidies, building their own public housing programs uh, that are not public housing for the poor, but public housing for a diverse collection, both racially and economically diverse, that can be a microcosm of what this country should look like. Now, I'm gonna uh, push back on you a little bit, but I'm gonna um, ask um, that Carol join in on this. Uh, when I look back at Parkland, and the Parkland shooting and the and protests after that. And I see the teacher strikes that occurred uh, maybe two, uh, two years ago and in, in often in red states. And then the BLM movement um, and criminal justice. I, I mean, I, I feel encouraged that there's or, organizing going on and somewhat of a movement. Um, so what's the difference between the last few years and the civil rights movement, in your opinion, I'll start with Richard, and we'll then go to Carol. Well, as I as I said at the very beginning, I'm very hopeful, and you're right. There are um, seeds of what uh, of of a massive movement that now in in a variety of areas. They have not uh, typically focused on housing policy, which, as I uh, believe, underlies all of the other inequalities that we have. And we're dealing with um, uh, organizing around symptoms, which we should address. I'm not critical of them, mm. but not on the underlying cause. And unless we um, address the underlying cause, uh, we're going to be fighting the symptoms for a much, much longer time than we need to be. Carol, um, what's the difference between today's movements and the civil rights movement? Mm. Hmm. I think that. Um, to me, one of the things I was thinking about the housing question, I'm, I'm sorry, and that was 
is that we think of housing as an individual profit good instead of as a human right. And it is that framing, not as a human right, that I think has been part of the difficulty in getting traction on it as a movement building uh, with its movement building capacity. So it keeps running up against these market forces, market forces, my profit, my profit, instead of thinking about how housing is absolutely essential as a human right. And so I th- there, there are organizations that are beginning to do this work and have been for a while on housing as a human right, but it's, it's running up against these major kind of market forces. Um, and, but when you think about the earlier movement, when you talked about like the, the March on Washington, right? It was the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. And, and so, but we often think of it in terms of just civil rights, and not the broader components of human rights, such as these economic rights to a quality job where that pays a living wage. And I think that that is part of what we, we, our next phase of movement building has to really begin to structure this, all of our capacity about healthcare, about education, about housing as a human right. I think that that's where the next phase has to be. Well, before folks go out in the street, as as uh, Richard and Carol's ex- uh, uh, suggesting, get out in the street, go pick up their book, One Person, No Vote, Color of Law. Among, I mean, they have others, but make sure you go uh, pick those books up. And you can also get my book, Know Your Price, Valuing Black Lives and Property in America's Black Cities. And, and also make sure you tune into the National Book Awards November 18th. Mm-hmm. Um, it's going to be a, a yet another incredible event. And, and before you do that, make sure you give a little contribution to the National Book Foundation. They're doing good work. They're putting on events like this, um, which is remarkable. So on behalf of the National Book Foundation, Carol and Richard, I want to say thank you for tuning in. This has been an honor of mine. It's been a pleasure, and I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you.